All right, welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, today we're going to be talking about bed bugs in schools. And before we get started, just some general Zoom housekeeping. Um, we are going to be recording this webinar. So for those that were unable to make it, they're going to be able to view it on our website later. And a copy of the recording will be sent out to everybody that registered, including yourself. So keep an eye out for an email about that. Um, we do request that you stay on mute for the duration of the presentation. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop it in the chat box. I'll be monitoring those questions and answering them as I can. Um, otherwise, we will have some time at the end for Jody to answer some questions as well. And so to introduce our speaker today, um, well, first, my name is Kate Chapman. I'm um, an extension educator and urban entomologist with Nebraska Extension. I'm based here in Lancaster County or Lincoln, Nebraska. But our speaker is Dr. Jody Green. She's also an extension educator and urban entomologist. And she's based in our Douglas Sarpy or Omaha office. Um, Jody and I work extensively with education on things like bed bugs and cockroaches and head lice, um, even plant pests. So we have a passion for insects and we're really excited to talk about bed bugs in schools today. Um, so we have three learning objectives that we hope that you can take away from our presentation. The first is to understand factors that make bed bugs successful pests and the health risks that are associated with them because we know bed bugs are issues that we want to be able to manage. The second is to identify the most effective practices for preventing the spread of bed bugs in school environments in particular. And then the third is to identify important elements in developing a bed bug action plan because we know that while bed bugs are prominent in homes and hotels, we can also encounter them in schools. So it's important to have an action plan in place for when something like that does happen. So I'm gonna go ahead and send it on over to Jody to get started on our presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So I love talking about bed bugs. I do get a bed bug question or sample brought into our office pretty much every day. And so we'll start off, though, talking about identification, biology, and how that biology of that bed bug makes them so successful. So this is the human bed bug and bed bugs are passive humans. And that's why whenever we talk about them, it's wherever humans go. And so that makes it kind of tricky because without humans, um, we may not have that problem. So the scientific name is Cymex lectularis. And these are um, images of uh, bed bugs. And one is an immature and one is an adult. And you can see um, some very interesting things about these insects. First of all, all insects have six legs. Um, and, and so they will look very similar in that way, but they do not have wings. And many insects have wings, but bed bugs at any stage in their life will not have wings. So they do not fly and they don't have jumping legs. So they don't jump either. Um, they are typically considered an oval shape and they're flattened from the top down. So flattened like a pancake. So that's a little bit different than fleas. They're flattened side by side. And then that last picture there, those are their eggs. So they're not, they're not round, they're elongated. And that little red dot is as their eyes. So when you can see an egg like that, that means it's a viable egg. And there is a tiny immature bed bug developing inside. So bed bugs are successful because they are small. But I do want to let you know that they are visible at all stages of life to the naked eye. Just sometimes um, with bad eyesight, a little harder than, than most. But you can see um, in the first picture there on the left, you can see that we've compared different bed bug stages to different types of seeds. And so that first one is a poppy seed, and then it goes uh, sesame seed, flax seed, and apple seed. So many times adult bed bugs are referred to as the size of an apple seed. Um, and you can see that these are bed bugs at different stages and whether they're full or not. And then the one beside the penny. So they are small, they can be transparent. And sometimes you can see what's in their guts, which is kind of gross um, because typically that's blood. So, um, you know, these are what um, bed bugs look like. So as an adult, they're about a quarter of an inch when they're not fed. And then when they are fed, they can be um, a little larger. They get um, elongated. So they also reproduce quite 
quickly. And so sometimes you may have uh, more bed bugs than you thought you did. This is the typical life cycle of a bed bug. So they could undergo gradual metamorphosis. So they don't go through a pupil stage or where they go into a co cocoon stage. They pretty much look like smaller wingless versions of uh, the adult. So every bed bug has to feed on blood to survive. The go through different instars, which are stages of development. And you can see that um, when they're not fed, they look very different than when they are fed. So that's why it can be hard to identify them at times. So they go through egg, nymph, and then adults. So they can uh, lay eggs. So a female, after she has mated, she can store that sperm and lay eggs up to 50 days um, after that mating. Those eggs hatch usually between a week to 10 to 12 days. And then in optimal conditions, which are about uh, 70 to 90 degree Fahrenheit and having a regular blood meal, they can complete their life cycle in five to six weeks. So that can be pretty fast. And then their total lifespan can be six to 12 months. And um, the reason for that gap, because it, it really depends. Um, some of these studies have been done in laboratory settings. And so bed bugs aren't um, expending a lot of energy moving around looking for a blood meal. Um, and dehydrating. So some of them have been shown to live a little bit longer. And um, a female throughout her lifespan has the capacity to lay 200 to 500 eggs. So that can be quite a bit. Uh, bed bugs are also really excellent hiders, so good at hide and seek. And so often that's why we don't see them. They are, are small and flat, so they can sneak into the smallest and tightest little crevices um, in, you know, bed sheets around beds, around where people are resting, underneath um, tacking or um, dust covers of different furniture items. They can even sneak into little packages, as you can see there on the right um, there's a little tiny um, bed bug nymph in these these areas. So it is completely, um, you know, it's not unusual that you will miss them because they are so tiny, but they can be seen. Um, they're also professional professional hitchhikers. So, you know, if they don't fly and they don't jump, how do they get around? They get around by using us. They get onto our belongings and get on our things and move around because we take these things around. So there are many occasions that that I've been around different places. And uh, one, one period in time, I was exposed to this person that was carrying this backpack and they had no idea that they were actually carrying around uh, many bed bugs on there. So those bed bugs are hitchhiking and they can either fall off, get brushed off or, you know, be, be left somewhere. So this is why when it comes to a school setting, when you think of um, infestations that may have people living there, bringing around items that may have bed bugs hitchhiking on them. And um, this is, you know, a very common way that they get around. So our first question that we have for you is, have you ever encountered a bed bug? And I will have Kate launch the poll. Jody, can you see the poll okay? I can. Perfect. So it looks like the majority of people have answered here. And so sharing the result, majority of you have encountered a bed bug. And this is not very unusual, as Jody will say in a second. Yeah, so the statistics say that one out of five Americans have had a bed bug infestation either in their home or knows someone who has encountered bed bugs at a home or a hotel. Um, if you listened to me talk before, it seems like I uh, have that problem, especially when I go to hotels. So a lot of the things that I'll talk about today on prevent preventative measures, um, preventing bed bugs from coming into your own home or something that I practice myself, but it's not uncommon. And um, you'll see that bed bugs um, do not discriminate. You know, they hitchhike with with anyone, any way that they can get around. And there have been some surveys out there. Um, there's one, uh, Bugs Without Borders. They did uh, a survey to pest management professionals and they asked them what areas or what types of industries do they treat for bed bugs. 
And 47% said that they have treated schools or child care um, facilities. So um, not uncommon at all. So a little bit, we need to talk about bed bugs in human health. And uh, when it comes to a lot of vectors, people worry um, because they feed on blood and they feed on humans. So um, let's first talk about their, their, their biology in terms of their mouth parts and why and how they can feed on blood. So they've got, uh, they're a true bug in all true bugs. So if you think of uh, stink bugs, they have this piercing sucking mouth part. So it's like a straw and it's tucked underneath. So sometimes you don't see it, but they feed on liquids. And so sometimes it's plants for bed bugs, their liquids are gonna be human blood. So they use that to take a blood meal from people. And so when you see them feeding, this is what it looks like. So they'll, they'll pierce you. And oftentimes the host cannot feel it. I've been fed on by a bed bug and I've actually watched them feed and I can't feel that. Um, and that's due to some of the, uh, the, their saliva and how it's got that anesthetic. So this is what they look like after they feed, um, you know, they become very red and these bites can cause an allergic reaction, but only in some individuals. So this is a little bit of a, it's not so fun fact, but 30% of the population, it's said to not have any reaction to the bites. So they've had bites, but no reaction. So no skin reactions, no itching, um, no, no obvious symptoms. And it is thought that 40% of the population of senior citizens, so 65 and older actually show no reaction. So you can see how this can be a problem. And if you don't know you have bed bugs, you don't know about bed bugs, aren't looking um, and having no reaction, you would be completely unaware that that this is this is happening. So you wouldn't know that this is um, that there are bugs in the house or you know that you're being exposed to it. But the compounds that bed bugs inject um, to feed on blood include anticoagulants and different enzymes so that they that allow um, blood feeding. And over time, bed bug bites can change or that reaction. And uh, unfortunately, this is me. And over time, I have become more allergic so that I cannot feed a bed bug. I will know that a bed bug has fed on me if I'm at a hotel because of the strong reaction. Bed bug bites can be even a delayed reaction, could be a, like up to a week. Um, but certain people can be very sensitive. And it's important to know that when someone shows you a bite or a reaction that you, that cannot diagnose a bed bug. So like, you know, this, this could be something else I know as a bed bug, but you cannot look at a bite. Doctors cannot, I cannot, um, you know, school nurses cannot look at a reaction and say that was a bed bug bite. So um, bed bugs on the good side, they do not spread disease. They have been shown to be able to harbor or um, contain 45 disease causing agents uh, or pathogens in their body. But in order to be a competent vector, um, an insect or arthropod needs to, you know, acquire it naturally or, you know, somehow in the environment, be able to maintain it and replicate it and then transmit it to humans. And so somewhere along the line, they are not able to do that. So there, there are always ongoing studies about that. You know, there's um, been some talk about Chagas disease and which is also called like um, from passed from the kissing bug, but they are not able to, um, transmitted to humans. So at this time, bed bugs have not been shown um, to be able to be competent vectors. So um, this is something that's ongoing and we will definitely let you know if that happens. However, there are a lot of negative impacts due to bed bugs and one of those can be anemia. So if you picture, you know, a small child or someone that is being fed on by lots of bed bugs, night, um, after week, after after months, after years, they can develop anemia. Um, this has happened to researchers who typically feed their subject matter because um, that's that's the food to keep their colonies alive. So that has happened. Bed bugs also produce histamines, and that is very high in bed bug feces. And so, you know, when bed bugs are feeding, they're also um, digesting blood and pooping out blood, and they're also um, molting to get to their next stage. And all of those things can produce histamines. And after bed bugs are eliminated, that human threat to that allergic reaction can continue. So, you know, rashes, 
uh, respiratory issues, even GI um, issues as well. So there are some health impacts, even if it's not disease. And if you look at this picture, this is a severe infestation of bed bugs. Um, you can see there's all different stages, a lot of feces, a lot of exoskeletons. This is going to cause an allergic reaction. So even if this is cleaned up, um, that will still remain there. So that can be um, a health impact. Other negative impacts include psychological impacts, um, loss of sleep. Uh, you know how it feels when you when you don't sleep, when you have anxiety. A lot of times when people have had a bed bug infestation and no longer have that infestation, they still have a hard time sleeping and it does cause a lot of anxiety. There are a lot of social impacts as well. Sometimes uh, people will definitely isolate themselves. They will not go to work. They won't go anywhere because they um, have that negative perception of bed bugs. There is still um, such a social stigma against bed bugs, even though we know that anyone can can get bed bugs or be exposed or bitten by bed bugs. And then the economic impact of bed bugs, most times people who find bed bugs throw away their bed. And that is not something that we recommend uh, right away. Or, you know, so a lot of these things can be treated and it may not just be the bed, but the cost of discarding furniture and buying new furniture, the cost of eradication efforts, whether it's professional companies or buying uh, do-it-yourself products. And then, um, miss school or an employment that can really impact a family um, financially if they are dealing with bed bugs. Um, there's also, you know, health issues that come up when it comes to using pesticides. So regular people, I would say, don't read a lot of labels. They see the word bug bomb and they're like, great, we're going to, we're going to kill all the bugs. Um, and we, time and time again, see this and it's very unfortunate. I've actually been interviewed on the news by that, um, the bug bomb incident. So you can see that, um, you know, sometimes the solution is going to be worse than the problem because we have to deal with um, the risk, um, especially to, to children in those situations. So let's talk about bed bug prevention in school settings. So when we think about where bed bugs live, they're going to be where people sleep. They're going to be where we spend most of our time, a lot of times resting areas. So bed bugs usually feed um, in at night when their host is sleeping and they can uh, change their schedule if someone works, you know, um, nights to feed during the day while people are sleeping. Um, but they're going to be in those places. So you think of, um, you know, beds and, and bedrooms and, and recliners or, or sofas. When we think about places in schools, it's going to be where um, people are spending time relaxing. It could be with pillows. You may um, be also, if it's something that's uh, coming in from a home, where people are sleeping, then it can be in um, belongings, items, clothing, bags. And so that could be by lockers or cubbies, wherever um, people are bringing their things in from home. Unfortunately, we also see a lot of bed bugs in kind of extensions of, of a person. So if someone has a prosthetic or someone is in a wheelchair or a walker, that's not their person, but it is very close to them. And bed bugs can be found um, creating harborages in those, um, those objects that are with that person. And, you know, let's just say a, a pest control company came to, to treat that home. When that person leaves, they actually take that with them. So that um, belonging never gets treated. Also in schools, there are places where there's a lot of just kind of stuff we want to say or clutter. And so, um, you know, we advise people to bring in only the necessary items you need and to be able to store those properly. Um, this is just a, you know, a lost and found um, cart at, at one of the local schools. And you can see things pile up over time. Things get thrown in there. Maybe some people take it, but it's not necessarily like a good thing to have if you know, one of those items have, have bed bugs that can obviously, you know, be spread when people are picking those up and um, distributing them around. So, um, you know, even when you're at like the front desk, you want to be able to, you know, put your purse up, not have that around um, on the ground or, um, you know, monitor the things that you have around. Um, you will want to incorporate inspections into regular routines. So regular cleaning, you know, look around if you are, you um, 
somewhere that has a, a sleeping area or a resting area to be able to look around and look for those signs of bed bugs. Um, the people that are doing the maintenance or cleaning should be um, educated in, in that because sometimes um, because they are so small, it does take them an eye and like a sharp flashlight, a bright flashlight to be able to find those, those signs and those bed bugs. Um, unfortunately, there are monitoring tools out there. So there are some um, pheromones that have been, you know, formulated to attract bed bugs, which, you know, can be hard because they're attracted to carbon dioxide. They're attracted to people. So, you know, there are some, um, different pheromones that people have used and put them in traps. We also have intercept interceptor trap, which is this bottom picture here. You can see the, the leg of the bed or the furniture is put in this kind of saucer. Um, I have one here that I can show you. Um, it looks like this. This is how um, the profile of it. But when you look inside this, this is um, like a rough surface. There's a little moat, which is a smooth surface. And so if bed bugs aren't already on the bed, um, you can, you know, put the bed leg in here. But even without, um, without that, if you just put something like this out there, bed bugs and their behavior, they wander around a lot looking for a host. So they can um, walk up this rough side and then fall in that smooth side and they can't get out of there. So that is um, a good thing to have because you can see what's what's around your house. You can see if you do have bed bugs. And then after a treatment, you can also monitor to make sure they are going down. But um, we also have bed bug detecting canines. And so they are trained dogs to detect viable eggs and bed bugs. What is important to know about this is that they should have a handler that is also trained. And if a bed bug, if a dog hits on um, the scent of a bed bug, that that handler can confirm that infestation. So they can confirm and see that bed bugs are in that area. Sometimes dogs will are trained to bark. Sometimes they're trained to sit down. Um, but uh, some of these places are really good at. Um, trying to cover a lot of ground in a, in a small amount of time, especially when there isn't um, a sleeping area. So sometimes, you know, with schools, um, office buildings, libraries, uh, dogs are really good. Um, it's a really good monitoring tool. But again, um, bed bugs are attracted to carbon dioxide that we exude and that human scent and, and warmth. So, you know, that's what these take into consideration. Um, so things to look for, we do have uh, bed bug cards, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But, you know, actual live bugs, sometimes people see them. Um, they are a lot, you know, active at night. So you may see them more in the evening. Sometimes when people are scrolling on their phones late at night, that's when bed bugs um, may, may come out. You will also see cast skins. And so insects have an exoskeleton, so they need to shed their skins in order to grow. So during those five instars or stages of development, they're going to molt uh, five times. And so when you see those cast skins, that's where it's kind of a harborage, where they're going back to after feeding. And then um, you will see fecal stains. And so these look like black Sharpie marks and you'll see some light ones and some dark ones. And you'll find those um, on, on bedding or places where bed bugs are, are hiding. And then um, sometimes you'll see eggs. They can be, you know, glued onto different fabrics or places, but they can really be dropped or, or laid anywhere. And this is a library book. Um, on the left, you can see those, those spots. And so that is, you know, those are signs of a bed bug infestation. Oftentimes we, you know, have books by our bed. So that's an extension of the bed, just because it's not the actual bed that we're sleeping on doesn't mean, um, you know, bed bugs can be on many more places other than the bed. And then that picture on the right, that is, um, that's the bed frame. So that is um, a box spring, but that's the frame. And you can see all of those um, black marks those are um, digested and excreted um, blood from, from bed bugs. So we've got um, a second poll that uh, Kate has launched. Uh, the question is, how confident are you that you could recognize a bed bug?
Okay, I'm going to end the poll here and share results. So it looks like the vast majority of you have some level of confidence when it comes to bed bugs, which is excellent because as Jody will go into, identification is really, really key when it comes to these bugs. Yeah, well, that's great to see. Um, that's really good. I would say that's uh, not the norm uh, for the the public that we see and, and they get very surprised even, you know, I'm not the, the favorite at dinner parties, but when we talk about bugs and talk about bed bugs, it, it's surprising how many people cannot identify one. So um, bed bugs are going to look very different at different stages of life that we saw um, through that life cycle. And you can see even the same bed bug fed and unfed look very different. It's kind of like, you know, after Thanksgiving, how you may feel that you've got, um, like you're just so engorged and this is what they look like. So after a bed bug feeds, they can, um, increase their, their weight by three times their, their body weight in blood. So you can see how, how big this insect gets. Um, so based on that size, that shape, um, the age and that feeding status is going to be a little bit different, but we get a lot of uh, arthropods mistaken for bed bugs. Oftentimes it's because something was found in a bed and sometimes they're not even bugs, but you know, people think bed bugs, I found something, it looks like a bug and it's in my bed, it's a bed bug, but we really, really, really need to identify for sure and positively identify that we have bed bugs. So other things that are mistaken, bat bugs, yes, looks very identical to a bed bug, but very different. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that in, in our next slide. Carpet beetles, every house has them. A lot of times uh, they'll find the larvae, but if they find a beetle, um, not terrible because carpet beetles, they'll feed on uh, natural fibers. They feed on lint and hair and feathers, things like that. So, you know, feather pillows or, you know, lint in the bed, things like that. So um, that fleas, uh, fleas can be seen and they hurt when they bite. And sometimes they're found in the bed because people will sleep with their pets. And so, um, you know, that's just a, a little plug to have your, your pets, uh, treated for fleas and ticks. And then ticks, ticks are often found in the bed for that same reason. Um, they're often not found as adults or as big as this, because when they're on your pet, but sometimes we'll find different stages of ticks in the bed that have come on, um, come in from, um, a pet that goes outside. Um, going into, uh, the bat bug, cause it does seem very similar. We have a lot of training for, um, pest management technicians on how to identify this. Cause this is a very big deal because a bed bug and a bat bug, though they look alike, they have very different behaviors, harborages, treatment, all sorts of things. So if you can magnify and you can even use like a hand lens or a magnifier, um, if you've got a microscope or a lot of um, the schools will bring them here or their pest control company brings them to us is really the length of the hairs. I know they're, um, you know, in this uh, comparison picture, it's got the different uh, shapes of this. This is called the pronotum. Sometimes that's very hard to see, but these hairs here, right behind the eye, right behind the head, are very short on a bed bug. And right here on the bat bug, they're very long, long, beautiful hair. And so, you know, they're more adapted to living in uh, and around bats. So a bat bug, their primary host is a bat. Um, they're often found in really kind of weird situations where they're on top of the bed, not necessarily in the bed under the covers or, you know, between the box spring, they are going to be walking around the open. They're going to be on walls. They're pretty much in shock that they fell off a bat or crawled out of a bat harborage. Um, and they may be on windowsills. They're often found on the top level apartment on a, if it's a third story building, it's the third story, you know, by windows, things like that. So their behavior is very different and management is going to be first to exclude the bats, right? So you want to make sure that if there's a bug that comes in or found at school on a student, that it is identified as a bed bug. And most of the schools and the school nurses are excellent at, at reaching out and understanding this. Um, compared to a lot of, um, you know, unfortunate homeowners that will pay a lot for treatment of bed bugs only to find out years later that they're still dealing with bats. Um, and for people in Lincoln and Omaha, we are very batty. 
Um, this is the data from Kate and I, our office combined. And so we have a tally on how many bed bugs, how many bat bugs. And oftentimes it's in those summer months that we get about 20% of our um, submissives or, you know, that family of insects come in, 20% of them are actually bat bugs. So I just, this chart is just to show you how significant that is and why it is so important to identify your pest first. So now we'll go into the bed bug action plan. So um, integrated pest management or IPM in schools, that's something that we um, stress heavily. It's, um, you know, a majority of all our teaching is IPM because it's not just about spraying. It's not just about, you know, toxicity. It is about management. It's about identifying and it's about doing um, various tactics to decrease um, the harm and damage done by bed bugs. So integrated pest management when it comes to bed bugs, you know, we talked about it, identify and monitor. You want to know what's there. Is there just one? If you had some kind of monitoring plan, then you can tell that maybe it was just one this time, but you're keeping your eye open, right? You want to evaluate um, where was this bug found? How many were found? Because, you know, the longer problems go on, uh, the worse it can get, right? So we want to be quick. We want to identify. We want to know what's going on. And um, we want to start off with the lowest risk to human health. So it's going to be, um, you know, cleaning, sanitation, using different temperatures. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And isolation. Isolation in terms of what did you find the bed bugs on? And can we remove that from, you know, uh, bed bugs from spreading? So it's kind of like, you know, containing where maybe you saw it. Uh, if is it a certain room that gets closed off, it's kind of like a quarantine. And then as like the last option, it would be insecticides. So, um, so if a bed bug or if a bug is found, because you may not know if it's a bed bug or not, collect it for verification. Um, I think one of the great things that we're doing nowadays is just really stressing this so that people are not just smashing and flushing because that doesn't tell us anything when someone calls and told us they found a bug and flushed it down the toilet, right? We want to know what that bug is and what, um, what that risk is. And we also need to determine in that evaluation is, could this just be an introduction or is this an infestation? So introduction, you know, you're being introduced, you're getting dropped off. Um, you may come from a place that's infested and an infestation is going to be a place where people sleep regularly. This is actively feeding and breeding bed bugs. And so when it comes to, you know, where their infestation is going to be, it's going to be at home. It's going to be where the, where, you know, the families are sleeping, resting, hanging out, um, doing things together. Schools are usually a place that there's going to be an introduction because no one sleeps there. So, you know, there are, you know, the odd occasion where this may happen. And this is when things are not monitored. And when, um, you know, a, a high level maybe of bed bugs are introduced at a time. So that's why we want to maybe, you know, keep an eye on it and keep continued to monitor. So, um, you know, inspecting and continue to monitor is important. And many schools do have a regular pest control company that they trust that comes in and does those inspections. It doesn't mean they have to treat and every time, but someone that has eyes and is documenting what's happening. Um, when it comes to an infestation, this is going to be a management action plan that's happening at home. So um, this is not something that you necessarily have control over, but you are able to uh, maybe communicate with families to see if they are working on the bed bug issue at home and if they need some educational resources or, um, you know, to find out what kind of options they have. So what do you do if you find a bed bug? So try to pinpoint the source. And when it comes to schools, you know, find out if you know which school or which classroom, or sometimes you can, because of uh, repeated um, incidences, pinpoint where that source is. And if it's on a bag or on, you know, some type of belonging, you want to isolate those items with bed bugs. So normally it's going to be a backpack or an, an outfit or a shirt or um, a jacket. 
then you want to perform actions to prevent the spread. So you want to contain it, you know, put it in a, a Ziploc bag, a, a giant bag, put it um, in a plastic tote, somewhere where the bags, bed bugs are not going to spread. And then you want to go through your bed bug action plan. And so, you know, it can be um, what that, that process is. So, um, you know, every, every home or every person should have come up with their, their action plan on, on what they want to do with that or how they can manage that. Um, we can, we can go through that. But these policies are very important because if they are not something that people know about, when someone sees a bug, there's panic and, um, you know, really bad uh, PR or communication. And if you know what to do when you see a bed bug and you go through those action plans and everyone does it, it's, it's just going to be so more streamlined and it's just going to be better for everyone to, to deal with the problem. So the third question is, does your organization or school currently have a policy related to bed bugs? And I think Kate has launched that poll. So I realize I might have messed up the questions, but this one is related to school policy. I might have launched this one earlier, so my apologies. Give it a few more seconds here. Okay, well, I'll, I can just continue to go on to. So sometimes when I ask about, you know, bed bugs and what people think about bed bugs, sometimes they, you know, or ask about schools, they think of the case with the Plattsmouth schools. Um, I was working in Lancaster at this time and they found a bed bug. And I was not able to get in touch with them or answer the phone call that day. And what happened was that they canceled schools. And this made a huge kind of a PR nightmare because when people thought about schools, it was, oh, this, this school is infested, which it was not. But it did um, give rise to a lot of comments and people that had bed bugs at home um, were blaming it on the school. And um, it was it was rather unfortunate, and we don't recommend anyone canceling a school for bed bugs. There are some policies. Oh, yeah, and so the uh, the superintendent uh, made this comment about the uh, received a report of, of bed bugs at the school at the high school, and then the company was was in and treating. And so you know what did that even mean? Um, because you know maybe there weren't any bed bugs there. So what were they doing to treat? And then, you know, that exposure to insecticides, we're not really sure what ended up happening, but um, it was, it was a pretty unfortunate and we still don't really know um, exactly uh, what happened and if there were more bugs found there. Um, I did used to work with the, uh, the Lincoln libraries and they had, um, you know, they had a really great protocol. Did bed bugs come in sometimes? Yes, but did they get rid of it? Yes. So would we say the library has bed bugs? No. Um, there are schools and there's this ESU four that have this um, available, but you know they do write that no healthy child should be excluded from or allowed to miss program time because of bed bugs. And so you know this is really important to to let people know that there are guidelines that this has been thought of and that we are not eliminating or affecting um, the learning of children because of these bugs. Most of these times, I mean, all of these situations, this is not the child's fault at all. So important elements for a bed bug policy, you know, you want to find out what the situation is. You want to be able to communicate to families and um, we want to continue to have that child be able to have that academic growth without interruption due to bed bugs. Um, you know, what procedures are in place? So this bed bug action plan, you know, what is there to put in place for prevention um, from bringing them into the school, uh, spreading around the school, uh, monitoring, and then also management. So that is very important. So it, what is this situation? So it, did the bed bug, was it found on a child or the belongings? 
Um, also, is this bed bug alive or is it dead? Um, is, is the bed bug in a classroom? And then sometimes, you know, uh, school nurses may think or teachers may think uh, that a child has suspected bites. And as we mentioned earlier, you're not really sure. So sometimes that will require um, more um more questions um, for that child and to find out if those are bed bug bites, because again, um, you know, that could be caused by many other things. So if a bed bug is found on a child, we want to discreetly remove the child from the situation, but you don't want to draw attention or have any negative stigma um, and examine the clothes that they're wearing and their belongings and collect any bugs that you find. You want to isolate again, those, those, um, those belongings in, in totes or um, plastic bags, and then verify. So you identify and then you execute um, the, the, the action plan. If it's found in a classroom and you can't say um, who brought it in, you wanna make sure that you collect that again for verification and take note of the surroundings. Where did you find it? Um, what things were around that? Um, have a, a trained professional come in and inspect the area and try not to move things around too much because you don't want to be spreading um, any potential bugs. You want to document and map that site so that that area would be the focus of future monitoring. Um, and then again, execute the bed bug action plan. If you suspect bites on a child, oftentimes with a bed bug um, situation, it's going to be bites on exposed skin while sleeping. So it's going to be usually the neck, the ankles, the 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 feet, and the hands. But again, everyone acts reacts differently. And even if a doctor says this is bed bug bites, um, because sometimes they'll say, and this is this can happen, but it's not always. You know that bites are in a line, that they bite in threes then it's a bed bug. Not necessarily. That's a little bit of a myth, but it can happen. Um, so, you know, communication. Uh, administration and staff need to be aware of what was found and that should be part of the plan. Who gets notified? Um, you know, families. Contact the family, tell them what was found, where it was found, um, what policy is being followed and what expectations you have um, at, at the home, what expectations are there. Um, you want to do your best to avoid interruption. So we don't want to make bed bugs a stigmatizing issue. That's one of our goals um, in our programs is to make bugs not as scary because we want to educate and prevent. Um, so you want to maintain as normal a routine as possible. Sometimes those normal routines are coming in, uh, meeting with the school nurse, isolating items, changing clothes. Unfortunately, that's what what that normal routine turns out to be. Um, it like it's not necessary to interrupt that student's development by sending them home. If they find bed bugs and you send them home, you're they're going right back to the place that they're getting bitten. So. Um, it, it you know doesn't necessarily uh, make sense. Um, so proceed with this plan. So the plan, you know, is specific procedures. Who are the key individuals that have responsibilities in this plan? Who needs to be trained? Who needs to be trained of what they see, when they see it, how to secure a specimen? You know, how do they do it? Is it um, do they have tweezers? Do they have bags? What kind of materials do they have? Um, what do you do if you suspect bites? Where do you write that stuff down? Where do you um, document that? So, you know, early detection and a prompt response is the key to successful bed bug management. So you want to begin at the source and work outward. This is an example of like of an apartment or a home or a bedroom. Um, a lot of times the bed bugs will be close to the bed or on the bed, but not where it's normally disturbed or, or moved around, right? So cracks, crevices, folds. Um, and then, you know, the deeper you go, you may find bed bugs. But an example of a bed bug action plan. So, you know, these questions are here. And then for a school, this would be, you know, the, um, and it's going to be different for every school, but it, you know, this is what it would be. Like, who do you report to? Do you report to custodial? Do you prefer report to principal. It may depend on whether you have a larger school or a smaller school. If you're, um, 
you know, if, if this is childcare, if you're doing this at home. So, you know, make sure that this is in a document for your bed bug action plan. So this is followed all the time. So if someone's like, oh, we found a bed bug. Okay, let's talk to this person because they are part of this plan and it always goes this way. You know, sometimes it, the extension office is part of the plan, you know, right? Put Kate and I in there if you need to, or our offices. There are also... Um, a guide to teachers and staff, and it can be a flow chart. So if you want to put it in this form or even copy this, um, you know, this is something that will be helpful as a plan. Please, please feel free to use that. So, you know, different checklists, what materials you have, what's available. Do you have a, a clothes dryer that you're able to heat up clothes in? If you, if you are, that's great. Clothes can go in there 20 to 30 minutes that will kill all life stages of bed bugs. Um, if you've got a vacuum cleaner, if you've got a sticky lint roller, that's important too. And a lot of times people will ask me about um, the vacuuming and how to clean out their vacuum if they you know, have those kind of um, issues. And I just wanted to show you, um, I always call it like the, the, the pantyhose method. Um, and with the uh, crevice tool, I think I might get into that a little bit later, but I, I want to show you some of the other things that we have here. So when it comes to management, um, it's gonna be the IPM. So it's not one, just one method, right? One thing is we always call that the silver bullet. Everybody wants that, but that's not necessarily how it works. Um, we wanna make sure that uh, people can treat for bed bugs. And when we say treatment, it doesn't always mean a chemical treatment. Um, sometimes um, there are organizations that can help with um, preparing um, a home or an apartment for treatment. Um, sometimes it's community organizations or church groups. Unfortunately, people will call us. They're looking for financial resources for us to pay for treatment. And unfortunately, we don't have that. Um, some school districts or school boards may have that. And so it's something to inquire if they have a little fund for that. Um, but so far, I've only found one that does that. So the non-chemical options, um, vacuuming. Okay, so this is the pantyhose method. So this is the crevice tool, right? Right here for vacuum. This is pantyhose. Uh, I got it from the dollar store. I just like cut off the bottom part with the toe and you can feed that into the crevice tool or you can put it between this and the rest of the vacuum. And so what happens is that the bed bugs get caught in here, get sucked up. And so you can take this tight in a knot, throw it out. And so it doesn't infest your vacuum. Um, you can also, yeah, if you have to choose between washing and drying for bed bug treatment, you want to dry. You don't necessarily need to heat it up, uh, wash it. If, if you don't need to wash it, then don't. But if you, um, if you don't need to wash it, then just go right to the dryer. Um, people also will say steam, but the steam really does need to be very, very hot at the surface. And sometimes it's not necessarily like the steamers that you get uh, for clothes. Um, there are also like heat chambers that you can get. Um, Kate and I both have one. Um, they're about $200, but you can put things in it and heat it up um, for several hours. Um, I think ours can go like six to eight hours. So, you know, if this is something uh, and you don't have a home, uh, like a clothes dryer, maybe the school or the district has some of these that you can use and you can heat up the backpack and any of the belongings in there. Um, of the students that come in. Um, professional treatment options usually include insecticides. Um, they also can have a heat treatment option. And then in some cases, severe cases, fumigation, which is introducing a toxic gas, but you know they all can be effective, but it really depends on the situation. And I'm not gonna get in too far with management because um, if, if you do need more, please reach out. But, you know, there is comparisons. They are all expensive. Some are more time consuming than others. Heat treatment, that family needs to be out for six to eight hours. Fumigation, that family needs to be out for more than a day, 24 hours. So that's another set of, of issues, right? Um, uh, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of different options um, and, and there are some that are safe and there are less expensive options too, but it really you know, is gonna take the time. When it comes to whether a treatment is going to be successful, it's usually, you know, you have to consider the uh, population level and also the amount of clutter, like how much furniture and how many things people have. I do wanna mention that some things that don't work, we mentioned um, 
bug bombs. Um, people can get diatomaceous earth and there are studies that show that it can help. But when you have a 50 pound bag and someone's doing it at home, the uh, treatments end up looking like this, which is not effective. Dusts are supposed to be um, applied in a very thin layer. So, you know, um, that's, that's not effective. So, you know, rely on those professionals. When it comes to preventing bed bugs from hitching, um, hitchhiking home. So if you've got them in, the, you know, you found one at the school, you don't want to bring them home. Or if you found one in a hotel and you don't want to bring it home, you just want to make sure that you're isolating your belongings. So even your luggage, when you bring it home, you know, look through them, have things bagged, um, vacuum, inspect, and most importantly, do not store your bags that you've left the house with on your bed or in your bedroom. You know, put him in in the basement, put him in a garage. So that way, if you did bring home a bed bug, you um, will likely find it wandering around or it will, you know, desiccate, dehydrate and die because it didn't uh, find um, a host. Um, education is the key, though. You want to um, you want to make sure that students, teachers, other people know about bed bugs, that they exist what is the truth about them, and it can change their attitudes um, and um, interest about them. Most times now, it's usually like, ooh, gross, I don't, I don't want a bed bug. Those, that's, they come from dirty places. The more you know, the more you observe, even like live bed bugs, you'll understand that there's a lot of misinformation and stigma out there. So even, you know, with young children, you can talk about, you know, sometimes there are bugs that are in bed. You can make it not as scary, but if they see something to tell somebody, because, um, you know, they, they are out there. It's not, uh, it's not cutesy. It's something that they need to let their, their, their families know about it. So our takeaway message is that bed bugs feed on the body, but they don't live on the body. The school is not infested bed bugs have been introduced. And so when we have a case of bed bugs in schools, it's not um, it's, it's not necessarily because they are discriminating because they don't. It's just that the families that can't afford to treat are going to suffer longer and their children are going to continue to bring in bed bugs because they can't afford to treat or don't have those resources. So we think that policies will prevent that panic and that disruption for children because they are the most important thing is we are trying to keep them in school and keep them learning. And I'll leave this slide up to Kate. So here at Extension, um, in addition to having this webinar available as a recording, we have a lot of educational resources, both for schools and for families that may be dealing with bed bugs, and maybe you need to pass along some information to them so they can help manage the issues at home. We have, as Jody already mentioned, we're here to identify and consult with you. So if you have any questions, if you've collected any bugs and you're not sure if it is a bed bug, please don't hesitate to reach out for us. We have um, the bed bug ID card. So they're those wallet size cards that Jody had a slide of earlier. You can keep these handy with you um, both at school. And if you travel, you know, just throw it in your wallet and check for bed bugs when you get to a hotel. But we also have um, multilingual resources as well. We have brochures on preventing bed bug infestations. We have brochures on dealing with bed bugs. We have infographics on um, if they can't necessarily afford professional treatment, what are the safe and effective do-it-yourself options? So we have those available in English, Spanish, um, and Vietnamese, I believe. And if there are any other languages that you do need resources in, just once again, please reach out and we'll we'll try our best for that. And then we also have a website, lancaster.unl.edu backslash bedbugs, where PDFs of all of these are available, um, as well as just really... Um, any question you could have about bed bugs is probably going to be up there as well. So once again, um, these are available for you at no cost. Um, and we encourage you to reach out if you do have um, any issues or questions. And here is our contact information should you want to reach out. Um, once again, Jody is located in the Douglas Sarpy County's office. I'm here in Lancaster County. But we also do consultation statewide, so don't be intimidated by where we're located because we know this issue, um, bed bugs, as Jody said, don't discriminate, so they can happen anywhere. And Jody, there are a couple of questions that popped up in the chat if you're ready to take them. 
Um, the first one is, do we need consent to examine backpacks, clothes, and schools? Um, not that I know of. It might be something you want to check with administration first, but I think that's, don't they do that in schools? Like, I, I think, I have no idea. Yeah. But I, would but I feel to... like when you're bringing stuff in, they are able to. Yeah, I would check with administration just in case because every school might be different as well. Um, and it might just be you have to contact the parents first and foremost, but um, just double check before doing that. The next question is, does the clothes dryer need to be at any specific setting and do we need to have a separate dryer just for bed bugs? You don't have to have a, a separate dryer just for bed bugs. I, I believe they say high heat, but a lot of the clothes dryers do get hot enough and it's that dry heat. I think it's important to know that you don't want to shove it tight. You do need that airflow in there. So like that tumbling in the air, to, uh, the heat to contact um, that bed bug. So with bugs, they are, they're very um, susceptible to drying out and desiccating. And so that's what you're trying to do. So you don't need um, a specific heat. I would say like medium to high heat for, you know, 20 to 20 minutes would be fine. But All you right. just want to check the lint, lint catcher too, to make sure like, you know, if you do find the bugs, you want to re remove them and that can help. Um, you know, confirm or find out what the numbers are. All right. Thanks, Jody. If you have any other questions or comments, please put them in the chat box. Otherwise, we thank you so much for your time today. Um, appreciate you joining us for this webinar. And as mentioned, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar should you need to reference back to it. That'll be sent out sometime next week. All right. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Happy Friday. Thank you, everyone.